evening. Hello. On Thursday, Data Visualization DC is going to be right here in this room talking about 3D and AR visualization and creativity. That's going to be an awesome event. Thursday, right here. Okay. I, I haven't posted yet, but Deep Learning Adventure is going to start a couple of new adventures. One of them will be on uh, a community project, so think of it like this, but it will be uh, more like large scale project that we can all contribute to Journey AI. Another one will be on responsible and ethical AI. We'll actually look at some papers, some books, how to deploy AI responsibly, what does that mean for the people down the line. And uh, a few other ones around evaluating LLM. So it's going to get to that nature as you're going to see later today. But I'm going to post some uh, deep learning adventures from you know.
And then thank you for being part of our data science meetup community. And that's it. There was a slide. Okay, then I'll go back to this. Okay. So I uh, okay, so retrieval augmented generation. So um, again, so George Abrams gave a brief lightning talk. Um, no, because Will already gave the, like, do you want to your slide? Okay. So, um, George gave it one of our lightning talk speakers in August, um, and I've been trying to get more people to work, so we've been kind of working. He's doing his areas, week. I promise I'll be busy, um, because if you're like an L engineer, like, you're working very long hours, and you're kind of, like, kind of packed. We really appreciate that he is, um, that he's here tonight, and he's one of the speakers. Awesome. I'm going to roughly use the slides here. I was going through this like the other day, and I just kind of got I got angry at Bragg in general, <laughs> and people using it, and what it's being sort of touted as and everything. Uh, so the idea here, um, I'll talk a little bit about me, uh, about my work right now. We'll talk about the problem space that kind of we're using Rag for, um, and some of the changes we've had to make to it. Um, I will cover RAG broadly and, and all the different components of it, and while I'm doing that, I'm going to complain a lot and <laughs> tell you what's hard, what's easy, um, why you shouldn't just use some out-of-the-box you know, out software. You should really understand sort of the individual pieces here, because that's how you're going to make it work properly. Um, I'll talk about our big thing is intent routing and then multi-indexing, uh, and that has been really helpful. Um, and then we'll talk about how you actually evaluate this, how we try, because Again, it's not like having a labeled data set most of the time. Uh, and then we've got a quick sort of example we'll run through, some code, um, a little build your own RAG system. At the end, uh, there's different options you'll have in terms of you know, what do you want to do the retrieval on, different methods for the actual retrieval. Um, and just basically give you some starter code so you can break it down and look at it individually yourself and you're not reliant on any one package. Uh, we'll take questions at the end, but if something is you know, completely slowing you down and Google isn't helping, just raise your hand. Um, so I'm George. I meant to have a picture of me here instead of just that. So all right, it was a great start. Uh, I'm at Fable as a startup for uh, book clubs and book conversations. Um, it, we're moving into. Uh, we have great, actually, really great recommendations. If you do read, I strongly encourage downloading. If just to import your Goodreads data and then get recommendations from us, they are very, very good um, and actually maintained, unlike the Goodreads ones. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've been in NLP, I got really lucky, a uh, project I was in at Deloitte, um, and wound up doing NLP about a year before the BERT paper came out, uh, and have wrote, just been in the space pretty much the entire time since. Um, and so I've been going from trying to do like document classification using TF-IDF uh, vectors, um, all the way through now building these generative LLMs. So I've seen the evolution, um, it's been really cool, I've gotten very lucky. And if you want to talk about books afterwards, um, I'm a big reader, so at the, the courthouse social after this, let's talk. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, yeah, everyone wants to build a chatbot right now. Um, everyone who's, I'm sure your PMs are down your throat about, like, we need this and, and this and that. And we've unfortunately seen a Medium article on retrieval augmented generation, and they're convinced that you can take all of your data that you have right now, and you can build something that's useful and client-facing. And the answer is probably not. RAG is really, really good for doing unstructured search and getting kind of interpretable results from your data, and it's a really cool internal tool, and you should never, ever expose this to clients. It's just, it's, there's no good, uh, there might be some good use case. I, I would love to hear it if you have one afterwards, please, but it's just, it's a really, really good search and question answering for your data that you need to build a lot of guardrails around. Anything generative ML, the real solution to get anything in production is to put guardrails on there, building classification models to identify when things are, are going horribly wrong, <coughs> guide it to generate something that's a little better, a little more personalized, that doesn't feel like it's just, you know, you've gone to the stable diffusion or the Dolly 2 or ChatGPT and plugged in this. A lot of people are just making API calls, um, and that's not, you know, that's not useful. You, there's only so much room for so many general L, generative LLMs. Um, yeah. So what we're trying to do is get a, an LLM together to do book recommendations. And if you have ever tried to get any kind of recommendation from ChatGPT, you're going to know that you get uh, a lot of hallucinations. Um, you, you, it's not up to date. There's, you know, uh, it's 
I think it's about a year out of date, and even you know, look at the Lama 70 billion, that's right now six months out of date. It's not useful on finding new books. It's also, there's, you know, in our catalog, and our catalog is not complete, you know, we've got about two and a half million books that are on a good number of lists that people are, you know, actually reading. Um, and that is not a number that ChatGPT is, or, or any LLM at all is gonna be able to handle reasonably. Um, in the actual book recommendation space, right now, you can get pretty good recommendations if you go to, and I'm working bottom to top, sorry. Um, you can get good, pretty good recommendations if you go to Goodreads, you get really good recommendations on the table, you can get, Pretty garbage recommendations on StoryGraph, um, but if you can't actually sort of filter this by much more than you know sometimes genre or sometimes mood. There's a lot of different things that you might want to be, you might actually be looking for. So you might want an unreliable narrator. You might want all these different characteristics about a book um, that you are really looking for. You might be looking for a specific kind of leadership book or memoir. And the best way to do that right now is to put it in Google and to go on Reddit and hopefully you find a thread that is is relevant to you. Um, so, and then it's not personalized, well, you know you already like. So our objective's been, can we build a chatbot that we can find out what you're asking for and how you're asking for a book, because there are different ways that you can ask for a book, and then identify which it is, generate uh, a response that is grounded in reality and also personalized to you. So, um, but again, we don't want to have hallucinations. The second you put any hallucination, I uh, think the, the doom quote here, I should have done this time. Hallucinations are the vibe killer. Um, <laughs> so let's let's talk about what RAG is, just in case you're not familiar, you haven't been inundated with this uh, for the last six months, um, which I find unlikely. Um, and I've stolen a lot of this, but it's two phases. We have an ingestion phase where we're going to take all of our text data and we're going to basically put it into a vector database. We're going to chunk it out. We're going to put it into embedding, and then we're going to try and match against that. I'm just going to walk through the individual components here. So uh, chunking, and this is frustratingly is the most important thing you're going to do. Um, and I hate, I hate, this is my least favorite part of the whole thing, uh, but making sure that the vectors that you are matching against that you're trying to get good data for, um, and you're trying to match the input query to, this is going to have the absolute biggest effect on the quality of anything you do in RAG. So there's a lot of different ways you can partition your data and, and you know, you can break it up by sentences, you can just put the whole thing in as is. Um, you can split every X number of words. You can have those sort of overlaps here. I have the, the opening to Moby Dick here. If you want to see uh, that first paragraph in, you know, with a sliding window. Um, if you've done anything with like CNNs uh, or convolutional neural networks, you can think of the stride in the same way, that sliding window, except this is just in one dimension. Um, this is so important, and it's if you're using something that's out of the box, this is a thing that is is probably just done for you um, that you're probably not thinking about, but we found in a lot of like a lot of testing that we found the biggest variation in the quality of results by doing this. And it's it's, it's it, we're going to talk about we have encoded a couple different types of databases and different types of text, and they all need slightly different sort of versions of this. So you want to make sure that whatever you're matching against looks like what you're matching, right? So that's the biggest disconnect. Um, yeah. Start with, start with this and, and try matching algorithms. The other stuff that we're going to talk about in terms of the encoder and uh, the actual matching algorithm, the vector database, or anything like that, does not have the same effect. It's so much more fun to play with the hyperparameters on those things, and they matter <coughs> so much less. Um, all right. So just for encoding, in case you uh, aren't familiar with, um, basically when you take a text, you put it through any kind of you know, an LLM. Generally, it's going to be some kind of bird variant, just the encoder. Um, there's uh, a lot of things to think about here in terms of how, how big you want it to be. I think the context, or sorry, the, the vector sizes range from about, I think it's 384, um, and then there's some of the large ones, so like over 1600. Um, depending, this is something you've got to put your data engineering hat on for and actually think about how much RAM you want to use. It's not a fun process again, but you know, uh, you, we found really pretty consistent results with something like sentence bird, something like uh, to still burn in that 768 range for you know um, for a couple sentences matching against a couple input sentences. That's where I would personally start. Um, there's two kinds of embeddings you can get out of uh, an encoder. So the first is you're just taking the class token. Um, so if you're not familiar with that in in BERT, I think it's the first uh, token in all. Yes, yeah, definitely the first. Uh, the first token in. Um, in your, that you have as input winds up being predicted and it kind of roughly is supposed to represent a mean value. 
Um, a lot of research has been done. We found actually that the mean embedding performs a lot better in information retrieval tasks. Uh, the default for a lot of people is still to use the class token. I would strongly recommend against that. Um, yeah, the encoding itself is, it's, it's an, it takes a long time. If you, I mean, it depends. Um, this is, but this combined with the, um, sorry, this combined with the uh, chunking that you're doing is going to represent the vast majority of compute time for everything you're doing here. It's also going to be, this part is, you want to set this up like candidate layers of pipeline as best you can, so you can just pick a couple options and go, 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 test a bunch of things out. Storage is cheap, right? Um, you want to be able to swap these things out very quickly and iterate. Um, so I would recommend casting a very wide net, figuring out roughly what works and fine tuning your chunking and maybe your encoder, um, maybe your encoding mechanism. I really think it's going to come down 90% to chunking. All right, so you've done your encoding. Um, our next thing is to just kind of put this inside this vector database here. Um, so we created the embeddings. Um, and then if you're not familiar with RAG, what we're going to re really do is get the other embedding. Um, and we're going to get the embedding for the query uh, and then match that against the vector database we have for uh, all the stuff we're trying to get context from. And then use that as part of our prompt to generate something that's grounded in reality. Um, because chatbots hallucinate a lot. <laughs> um, so when we're doing any kind of vector database search, this is just an approximate nearest neighbors problem. Um, and really this is just, you're not gonna be able to, I know hopefully everyone here is familiar with cosine similarity, and you are not gonna be able to do cosine similarity on your entry against uh, like, you know, 50, 60 million rows very quickly. You're not gonna get that exact best answer, and that's okay. Um, I will say with something like phase and scan, they are deterministic after you've already built them. Um, so if you do put in the same thing, you're going to get the same results, uh, which is important. Um, but the tuning on that, those algorithms uh, are, are something you could spend time on. Um, we found very negligible value. Um, that's never where we're, we found, we found that changes in, in that has a meaningful impact um, if you do your chunking right. Um, this is the opportunity, though, that if you are matching against something, you maybe you split out by sentences, and I don't think I'm going to talk about it too much. In, I don't know if any other slides that make sense for this. If you retrieve, if you split your your document into 100 sentences, and you split the next document into two sentences, you need to take that into account. You're you know 50 times more likely at, at totally random to find this. You need to be weighting what your uh, like how frequently a document is present in that database. Um, you also get a distance metric generally. Um, I know with, with phase you do, a uh, spoiler, we're using phase uh, scan. I'm not sure if you actually get the full distance metric. Um, these are two things that are important to incorporate uh, into what you actually select, especially if you're going to do aggregation. You don't necessarily want to take your three best matches. Sometimes that works, and we do, you know, we'll, we'll take the number one match. Uh, but you can also do things where you, you know, you split it out. We're searching against, you know, we have books and we have descriptions and reviews of books. Uh, one book might appear, you know, number two through number six. It has, you know, five sentences that are really, really powerful matches. We want to be able to aggregate the smooth that have that. Uh, and so when you're thinking about this, you now have, you can be figured out what book it is. We now have the power to connect that to all the things we're doing that are already good data assets. We build good recommendation models. We know which authors are like other authors. We know what books you're probably going to like from those recommendation models. We now can connect this to structured data. This is the really key part where it's not just about getting text, it's about tying in your other sort of data science products, or AI, not AI, AI is a garbage word, um, <laughs> your other ML products <laughs> into, uh, into whatever you're, you're doing here with the chatbot. This is your opportunity to do that. All right. Um, yeah, so you have, you've now retrieved the relevant data for you, for, uh, you know, you've gone, you've got your top matches, however you're, whether those are your one, two, and three, or maybe they're just gonna pull your, um, you've smoothed over it in some kind of aggregation or weighted, whatever you wanna do. Um, you now have to get this in and like generate text from it. I'm gonna like, I don't know if you guys have ever built your ag systems and you've seen, oh, we have a system prompt, we can tell it what we want it to do. They're so bad. The system prompts are <laughs> trash. They are loose recommendations at best, and there is a little value in putting it for style and like how you want it to talk, but it's garbage. Um, Llama, ChatGPT, they're all totally trash, and it isn't. <laughs> it's, it's really very bad to try and use a system prompt to guide what you want it to do. You need to insert like very explicit instructions in RAG that says, be grounded in the results I am giving you. Make a recommendation based on this. Um, both sort of, really, we've had to put it at the top and the bottom of what we're sending to our, our chatbots. 
um, or to our, to our LLMs. Otherwise, it just turns out so bad. That they'll try and make, rec especially if you're doing it in the context of something like a recommendation, it is very frequent that it, you'll say, recommend me a, you know, a, a big postmodern book, and we're able to find that, extract, and go, oh, it's, you know, here's all the context for infinite jest, and it's like, here's everything about gravity's rainbow, and why you should be that. It just totally ignores what you put as your input query, uh, unless you're really, really heavy-handed with it. Um, it might get better. Uh, that would be interesting if they suddenly started listening to system prompts. It's just a parallel management of putting your user data and pretending the user has sent this and grounding it in that. Um, that's one of the big things that you're going to find if um, you know, you're using one of these uh, services for a rag. That's the big trick. It, like that and good encoding are the, the big tricks, the big chunk things to do with encoding. Um, Lastly, there's a couple strategies, and this is, I've found interesting. Um, I've done stuff in a fine, I actually haven't done that produce. I want to try this out of doing research and found this. Um, basically, the idea being once you, you know, how do you want to generate the, uh, the queries, or how do you want to generate the text? Um, three approaches here. Uh, stuffing just being you take everything, all the context you got in that vector search, you stuff it in there, and use that as one prompt. Um, you could do refine where you put it in piece by piece by piece. Um, that's what we've done, and that generally works if you've got a good, if you're very comfortable in, with your results. Um, I think it works very badly, and in my experience, if the first result you have is kind of off base, if you're not very confident in that first answer, um, it gets harder for the chatbot to move away from that first answer. Um, so refine is a lot more sensitive to that. Uh, MapReduce, and I think this is interesting, I, I'm actually going to do this like tonight. Um, is <laughs> you split out and you make like four requests with their four, four pieces of context, and then you take those four and you send that as a new query to the chatbot, who's then supposed to consolidate those four. Um, that seems to be a lot less susceptible to one bad result if you have three good results, um, which, yeah. So that is at a high level rag, or a medium to high level rag, the individual components. Um, let's talk about why that's just doing a plain vector database search on views or on um, our tags or something like that is bad for, for us. Um, for, for Fable, um, we, we need a lot of, you know, we wanted to be able to handle things like the FAQ. Um, so someone comes in and says, hey, I've been billed twice or I want to read for this book. Um, that is not something we want to be searching our entire vector database for you know, reviews against. That's not useful. Um, if we want to say, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can ask for uh, a book recommendation, right? So, you know, I want you know novellas with unreliable narrators. I like Philip Roth. Can you sniff me books by similar authors? Uh, a personalized review for. Do you think I'm going to like against the day? Um, unfortunately, we do have to. I want a spicy vampire romance trending on book talk. <laughs> part of my job. Um, but those are all really different questions and all require different sets of structured data and different things you want to match against. Um, so as a result, what we really want here is to have a RAG system that is um, basically a lot of different RAG systems that you're classifying for, knowing what our model does well, doesn't do well, know what we have certain ML assets for, uh, and we can personalize for. So a lot of work, uh, I'm just going to be PM, but sitting with PMs and like figuring out what is it, it's clearly defining what our chatbot is going to be good at, what's going to differentiate it from just getting a, a regular, um, uh, you know, a recommendation from ChatGPT or something like that, knowing what we really do well as a company, uh, and then tying that into something that is really using RAG as a format to um, engage with people and, and make our assets a little more accessible. Uh, and as a result, you wind up getting to take advantage of all, you know, your structured data too. So, you know, you, you might want to change how you, you know, the context you provide based on, and we do, we have different prompts for it. You know, author like author, or uh, book like book, or uh, book that meets these criteria. Um, those are our personalized review for a book. All of those have very different prompts, and you can't just do that with an out of the box, you know, chat system. You could tell the chatbot to, hey, you know, based on the user's query, um, you know, could you make try and make sure that the response is, you know, matches that. Um, but with the amount of that becomes really, really hard to do with the amount of context you provide, and it becomes a really delicate balancing act. If you can use traditional ML techniques here for classification and knowing what you want your chatbot to actually do, it's going to save you so much time. It's also going to make debugging a lot easier. Uh, we'll talk about evaluation next, evaluation next, um, because evaluating just 
performance of a, of a RAG system is a not fun thing, um, even, even in the best of times. Um, this has been really helpful for us to identify sort of where things are, are going well, where things are not going well, um, whether that's in the routing. And as long as it's the routing, that's something we can solve. We can get more training data. Um, we can build better routing models. Um, if it's elsewhere, then you need a 22-year-old who wants to be a data scientist. Um, so let's go through and dive through your logs. Um, um, yeah. So Bert's great. Um, I, I have a lot of love for Bert, um, as I said. Unfortunately, you don't want to use that really as your routing. It's a big model. Like Bert standard, Bert large is not a, a useful model. Um, you, with your chatbot call, you don't want to have to be doing a full classification on Bert. Everything else, pretty much I'm going to speak about here is some variation on, on BERT. But you, first, training a full BERT for classification in general, I think is, a, is probably a bad idea outside if you've got really long form text. Um, even then, there's a lot of tips and tricks, and we'll talk a little bit about um, Laura just in case you missed it uh, in August um, about that. But fortunately, I, BERT is a bad option. Um, you don't want to just take large BERT. Um, there, there's layer freezing, um, and again, I think layer freezing is, is another way you can, you can take BERT, and you can, you can do layer freezing with any model, but the idea with layer freezing is we can basically just train the last layer, or we can do forward passes and train all the layers the first time, some of the layers the second time, uh, and basically train fewer and fewer layers. This is a reasonable approach. It's still gonna be relatively slow, and at the end of it, time for inference, you're still using a full whatever BERT model or, or whatever you're doing. Um, it's going to take a lot more time. There's no reason to, to do this. Bird is, bird is overkill for routing, uh, especially if you're going to get relatively short text. Um, the embedding. Um, yeah, the one thing, and this is, we, we tried this out, this works actually very well, and it's a very negligible compute, um, is you can just put a dense net on top of your embedding that you're going to use for the matching and try and use that for the routing itself. That's actually very efficient. Um, the compute there is, is very negligible. Um, performance is going to be really dependent on your problem and how much training data and all the, the typical problems you have with classification. Um, but if you have a relatively easy problem to classify, this is where, what I would go with. Um, very, very easy. And at that point, you can then route to the correct vector database, right? So we know that you know, if you are looking for a book like the book, that's easy, we can point you to the, you know, we can figure out which book you're looking for and then find a book that's similar to, to it. Um, I don't have any, I'm just making sure I'm okay. Oh, I'm okay. All right. Um, Cool. So, um, sorry, question. Yeah. In the previous slide, so this is a case if you have multiple vector databases, right? So should, yeah, if you want a book launch or something else. Yeah, or if you want to change how you're, it's not necessarily you have multiple data, vector databases. So if you have one vector database, and that's going to be the one you search on for everything, but you want to handle the structured data that you do afterwards. So maybe you're still, you're comfortable on uh, doing a movie recommendation and you like, based on, um, like, maybe like there's two states, and the ones we have are like, uh, the actor who's are in it and the um, and like a description of the movie. And maybe you still want to just search the full description for that and you have one vector database, totally fine. But you might want to change how your prompt is handled in that situation. Sure. And so if you have a different prompt or a different, you know, any other downstream tasks or ML assets you're gonna pull in, you probably you want to handle that differently and this is the place to do it is right after you get that prompt, is change the behavior from there. Uh, and I'm going to talk about Laura uh, again um, because I, I love Laura. I use this a lot. Um, and so this is uh, uh, low rank adaptation. And this is a way that you can train large models on, on low compute with linear algebra trick that I'm very frustrated I've never thought of. Um, everyone should be. Uh, uh, so a uh, quick refresher on transfer learning. Um, you know, Basically, the way you do it is you're going to do your you're going to update your model weight step by step by step every iteration. At the end, your trained model is just going to be those model weights um, plus the sum of all the changes. Uh, and so, when you look at it like this way, one way you can think about it um, is to just think about you know you could do a forward pass and have an untrained network on the side that mirrors exactly your current model weights. Uh, and in that situation, you're obviously if you're training all of this. It's terrible because you just doubled the, the amount of RAM you need. You've doubled your, your compute on the forward pass. Um, however, the, the real trick behind this, um, it, and again, it's, it's huge. 
Um, that's a very, very, that's what, 16,000 odd um, model weights. You've got a new right there. Um, that is not going to be fun. But what you can do um, is well, you can break down that matrix, right? Where the, I hope, I hope everyone here is in agreement that everything you do in the deep learning is just matrix multiplication. Um, and so what you can do is you can you know, break, decompose a matrix here. So the idea being that if you multiply a 128 by 2 and 2 by 128 matrix, you're going to get a 128 by 128 matrix. So you can basically approximate the changes you want to make to your network um, for a fraction of the compute. It winds up being, you know, in practice, something like 1% of the requirement um, for uh, your gradients that you're storing, as well as the momentum, uh, the momentum you're storing. Um, so in that forward pass, it's a little bit more expensive, but overall, the amount of RAM, which if anyone has like, tried to actually train um, any kind of large model, um, you're probably most likely to be RAM constrained uh, on your GPU. Um, this is the trick to get around that. So I strongly recommend, well, we have, I have a, in the demo, or in the sort of the interactive session, we have um, Pef and, uh, an implementation of this um, that we'll take a look at and have a trainer that should work just fine. Um, but this is, I love Laura. Laura's like actually, even, and even if your model fits in your current GPU, in your G, the RAM in your GPU, um, what you're able to do with Laura is you can, you can increase your batch size, you can do all, you can spin up a couple more models, you can do all these things, or you can turn your model tank after. There's just everything you wanted to do, um, and you, instead of just doing a single forward pass and a single observation, you can iterate a lot more quickly by increasing your batch size, you can test with more hyperparameters, you can look at more learning rates, you can fail faster, um, which is just important in model training. It's hard to get to the right sets of hyperparameters. Yeah. Uh, one question on this. So, is it all? Do you always do a matrix decompose? Or Every neural network you've ever trained, you can do a matrix decompose. And wouldn't that depend on just the, like the parameters in the original matrix and how they're arranged? No. I mean, it's all, you can always multiply two smaller matrices to approximate a larger matrix. Um, what a lot of research has found is that the, and so rank is, you can think of rank as the amount of information in a matrix. Um, now, the, what a lot of research has found is that when you're doing, like, even just the models themselves, they are, I think for some of the, uh, the bird, I don't know if it was bird, I think, because the bird, it's been a while since I wrote this presentation. I think some of the bird matrices are 128 by 128, the, the query key vector or value um, matrices that are one, that size, they have ranked about 90 to 95 which it means that they're, they're basically a lot of like duplicated information and in that they're too large. And so when you, then you think about the fine tuning and the changes that are actually made to those, the, the changes like in this, like some of the WI matrix that we're, we're thinking about the changes for, those tend to be ranked like three or four or five. So you can have very, very small approximations to adjust the weights here for fine tuning tasks. Yeah, and so, so you chose like a, for a you chose, like, how to you, uh, you're going to choose the rank that you decompose it to. So you're going to say that you're going from, you're always, I'm, most, I'm trying to think if there's any non-square matrices I can think of, but I don't think it matters hugely. Um, but all, you're going to pick which, which parts of the network, uh, the larger network, the sub-networks that you want to um, approximate, and then you're going to say, you know, then the PEFT is going to be very clever and basically create the approximation for there. You're going to pick two or four or eight or whatever number you want to be as your approximation. Um, but the smaller it is, the, the better because it's fewer things you need to train. Um, yeah, so in reality, again, you're doing your forward pass, and you have an increase in compute on that forward pass. That is a true statement. You have more parameters, more things you have to calculate. But when you're doing your back prop, you are no longer storing the values um, for your gradient for anything in the initial set of model weights, um, only the ones in the LoRa set. And you're not storing it in, um, you're not storing the, the momentum. So I, I'm, I'm sure you guys have, you know, 
blindly put in Atom before as your optimizer and torch. And that has momentum, which is basically a way to smooth out your gradient over time, so it's not too sensitive to uh, a weird batch and move a parameter too much. Um, but that means that you, every backwards pass, you've got to store the value that it was, you have to store the, uh, the gradient that you're calculating for it, as well as the momentum from before. So it's basically three times the, the model size, plus you have to hold the model itself in memory. Um, this is a very, very efficient way um, to fine tune models. Uh, you could, again, you could use this on a larger model, you could use this on a smaller model. I have not found an appreciable difference in models that I've trained um, with LoRa <coughs> and without even when I can fit them in memory. I find it much faster to iterate with LoRa uh, on a Distilbert classifier, on you know, uh, some kind of sentence in coding, something like that. Anything, anytime I'm doing transfer learning at this point, I'm using LoRa. Um, I, I don't see a good reason not to. Uh, and yeah, add inference. So that's only for training, the, that you have a, a slowdown in inference. Um, there's two options here. Um, so if you have, um, let's see. Yeah, so one option is you can just expand, you can do that matrix multiplication. You can have that 128 by two and two by 128. You can expand it out into that full square matrix. And then you just add it in in all the places where it's supposed to be. There is a zero change in, in runtime um, when you're doing inference now. It's just as fast as if you fine tune the original way. If you are going to, um, maybe you have personalized models for, for different people, for different departments. Um, maybe you're making like personalized images for a ton of different people, all your users, right? And at that point, it's actually really slow to load a lot of these models in. You know, Making gigabyte model takes a couple seconds to, to load and, and download and everything like that. Um, what you can do is actually just have the whole model architecture already preloaded, and the only thing you're gonna swap out is that small matrix. So instead of having to load um, an eight gigabyte file, you're having to load, you know, uh, replace you know, like, uh, two, three megabytes within that. It becomes essentially instant to swap out those models. So if you have the same architecture, and you're fine tuning them for different use cases, and you don't wanna spin up a ton of different GPUs, one for each use case, um, this is very fast. This is very, very fast. Um, Productionalizing from Laura is is just a breeze. I mean, yeah, you have lots of models, so you know, and they're all the same, the same architecture. Honestly, even if you had a very slight decrease in performance, which I have not seen in Laura, it would still be worth it for just your sanity um, and not trying to spin up a different GPU every time or having you know ten GPUs up one for each model. All right. Um, yeah. So how do you actually evaluate this? Oh, sorry. So if you, you can, is there like a, if you're using PyTorch or TensorFlow or something, or however you're, you're, you're training, are you able to just like select Flora and it's? So yeah, we've got uh, PEP in here, which is oh, a nice. package, and then walk through that as kind of the, the end of the demo if we have hopefully good time, but it's definitely there for everyone to, to look at and to steal from. Um, yeah, essentially you're just gonna specify a trainer object and you're going to take your, your PyTorch model and then pass it to here, and then in the trainer um, dictionary, what you'll do is you'll just say which layers you care about optimizing. Okay. Just the idea yeah, exactly. So if you have a model for every user for whatever your case is, you just you swap those weights in and that IO is so low. And so you have less storage requirements, you don't have to download. Um, <laughs> all right, chat by the eval. Um, there are three points of failure in, in RAG generally. Um, the first, in, in ours, um, in my system here, where we have some we would classify. Um, I guess the first one maybe doesn't exist for other folks, but um, the routing, right? You can obviously get that wrong. There's no reason you like you should think your model is going to be right 100% of the time. Um, it's important to build in a null state where your model isn't sure about where it should go. That's one thing a lot of people forget about um, when they're actually building this is they don't have enough information to point you to the right place. Um, this is really easy to diagnose. This is something you can get with logs. Um, internal testing is super important. I'll talk about that. But internal testing is very, very important to building you know, correct routing. Um, whether that's you're going to fine tune that model or you're just going to build another state that accounts for this, there's a lot you can do. And it's not always, I don't want to say that you should be using like an out, uh, like the Stilbert or an encoder classifier for all of these things. Um, there's a real chance you can use regular expressions in some cases. There's a lot of things. You don't have to overdo it. Um, 
be smart with how you're doing your routing. You don't need to, you know, bring a bazooka to a night fight or whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do it, we'll do it for, for the purposes here. Um, information retrieval, I think this is where, this is the hardest part to diagnose where something is going wrong, and it's also where things tend to go wrong the most. I think hopefully you take nothing away is that you're chunking matters a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. It's definitely the biggest thing you can do. Um, having really good logs and figuring out what you're matching against each time, your input, your output, trying to understand why that's happening is crucial. Um, and having a 22-year-old to, to look at that is also <laughs> crucial. Um, and in generation, this is probably a function of your prompt engineering um, or your, your routine. Um, the prompts themselves are something you're going to be able to, you have a lot of control over, um, and it's very easy to iterate on. You can assume you've gotten you know, reasonable data, and you can say, okay, assuming I get reasonable data, how does it work? Assuming I have like one piece of reasonable data and two pieces of garbage data, how does it work? Um, testing all of those things out, in a, you know, making sure you have done your due diligence, knowing that your information retrieval is, is not perfect, it's going to be important. Um, okay. okay, so I love having routing for our, our chatbot. When we tried to do it in a general way, it failed miserably. It failed really, really badly. We were looking up things where we just didn't need to look up. Um, it's made it a lot faster. There's situations where, you know, if we can identify the model as an FAQ, um, we're just searching our FAQ and there's like 12 things in there. It's, it's very easy. Um, it's also, it's let us be a lot more custom with the features we want to pull out of the text itself. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, so many references to a 22 year old. Sorry? Why so many references to a 22 year old? There's, uh, there's, there's an employee at Fable who is, does not like me and probably wouldn't be happy about this presentation. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm presenting a lot of their work. Um, <laughs> so it's respect for the 22 year old. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is, it is, a, it is a awful job and it is a really good way to, under, to learn. No, I, I genuinely, diving into these logs is miserable and it's going to give you a very complete picture of what RAG is and why it's either useful for you or not and where you need to tune. Uh, we, yeah, it, it's, you're going to build out, I would spend more time, I would genuinely spend more time building robust logging and tracking and diagnosing for individual responses than I would tuning your, your matching algorithm in terms of like using phase versus scan um, or ch changing your encoder. That is the first thing I would do when you're getting to this. That information retrieval and understanding why you pulled garbage and trying to make sure that you are getting to a place where your encoded data matches what it, your encoded data in your vector database matches what you're actually pulling in and matching against is the hardest thing to do. It's hard to know when you've got 100 million rows, like what your data is going to look like when you chunk it out in reality. It's hard to see that at a, you know, just scrolling through the data. You need to sit there, play with your end-to-end -end chatbot, flag where things look bad, and then diagnose why. And there's not a whole lot you can do other than that. I mean, you could probably build LLMs to, to check things in the middle, but I feel like at that point it gets to a, a little ridiculous in the situation. Um, no, this, uh, I want to thank you, Sean, a lot for the work you've done in <laughs> <laughs> and Donnie Girl. Um, thank you, Sean. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so, the question about uh, any thoughts about like embedding versus like full text search? Maybe uh, full, full text, text search, search is really slow. Um, oh. if, uh, oh. The hybrid search is. I, I wouldn't do a full text search ever. That's that's just going to be much slower at the. I mean, there might be a scale thing where it's a reasonable thing to do. Um, so it's slower at, at retrieval or slower at uh, embedding? And it's, it, the but retrieval for um, using like full text search is going to be slower. It's also got a, a higher memory requirement. Um, so the generally, I guess it depends on the size of your text we found it did. Um, we've used hybrid search in, in specific applications and actually um, when a keyword is really important for some of our, our model states, um, thinking specifically about something like uh, uh, the title or the author, um, where you're trying to get a very specific word out of there, that's where we use it. So we have used hybrid search in a couple places. We generally do a semantic search first to get in the right neighborhood and make that process a lot faster. Um, so you do a semantic search first, and then 
you you say, okay, here are my top you know 50, 100 embeddings that match to that semantic query, and then we'll do an exact search using the full text. Um, so you can speed it up that way. And like quality wise, yeah. like if, if if we like disregard performance for for a second, mm -hmm. like quality wise, like. If we have embeddings and equivalent full text search, uh, like is, it like text is, is one better than the other or it doesn't do it? I mean, if you trust your users to spell correctly and you have a bunch of millennials on their phones. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's, I would say, full text search, I mean, you're realistically probably using Elasticsearch at that point, and that's a lot more, and there's a lot more tuning that is involved there. I think you can probably get Elasticsearch for specific use cases to a better spot than semantic search. I'm not sure it's worth the headache. Okay. I would I would start with a, I would go with a hybrid approach and yeah. Yeah. thank you. All right. okay. That's it before we get into any yeah. uh, any demos or the demo line. Um, again, I'm gonna pull up this and hopefully this looks all right. I wish I had. <coughs> I'll send them to you. You send me the tribute. Is that all right? You just have to like, put in the comments. Yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll publish it. That is fine. All right. Um, routing and rack. So if you've got this, should be shared in the description. Abigail, is that a true statement? What is that? Oh, that's not the right thing. Um, <laughs> where did I put Sorry. The, oh, yeah, so the collab notebook? Yeah. Um, yeah, the link to the collab is in. Let me just, I'll type the lab and hopefully it's here. Um, is that an interesting is, is uh, in the, the, yeah, I'm just going to search my name. Data science, sorry, I had everything. I was so fair. I got you. Second result. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, great. Uh, Whew, that's fine. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to walk through and break down the individual components here. Um, if you got this great, if not, well, sorry. Um, <laughs> this should, yes, this is me. Oh, I see. I'm on the table. Sometimes there's a lot of things happening. Um, Could you make that a little bigger? I can try. Is any, oh, I'm good at computers. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, all right. This will run, give it a second here, install a bunch of stuff. Um, what we'll walk through here is I'm going to walk through a really, really basic version of uh, a RAG system. There's a lot you'll be able to kind of do by yourself here. Hopefully, you'll take this notebook offline and get your own Ooh. open AI key. Um, for the rest of uh, the next 10, 15 minutes, this one is live and, and you'll be able to get results. Um, <coughs> But what we're going to do here is just take some data on movies and their plots and some tags associated with them and try and search and get reasonable recommendations here. Um, and I'll highlight some of the problems about user input and why your chatbot needs to have this classification. Um, what libraries are you using? Uh, we're using Torch largely. Um, I'm going to be offended that I don't do a test train split because I'm lazy. Uh, <laughs> yes. so much more work. Um, <laughs> um, we're going to use PEFT as the, as the major one, I think, for, for the LoRa implementation. Um, but it's really just Torch and Transformers. And OpenAI, because you know, I'm not going to host a, a Llama 70 for, for this. And Phase. Oh, we got a lot of things. Ah, great question. All right. Is Llama what you would usually use? Uh, we use Llama. Yeah. Llama for us is cheaper, um, just in terms of we're, we have enough traffic that we're expecting that it's going to be cheaper to host our own uh, servers. Uh, can I ask you what, what kind of latency are you like, working with? Uh, Is it like what seconds? Time? Like when user types, it's uh, like what's the latency? Oh, the latency? Um, so we have one call. It's about three seconds total from input to response. We have one LLM call uh, in there. Um, or one series of LLM calls that are in there. Uh, the vector database retrieval, even at the scale of like 25, 50 million, is very fast. Um, we do some on the fly vector database construction in some of our specific use cases, asking for like genre interactions or things like that. But that adds about a half second of latency, but we're able to get a lot higher quality in our results. Um, all right. So we have uh, this data frame, which is just, and it says 
I didn't give you a split, I didn't use it, sorry. Um, uh, we have our plot synopsis and we have tags. So there's two options here, and I guess title if you were interested in that. Um, this, I think this data set is really a good spot to do um, some multi-indexing here, kind of classify. <coughs> the training data set I have generated for this is not gonna be very helpful for uh, that, but that's all right. Um, and so here we have two functions in terms of splitting. Um, you can also use the NLCK punct as a sentence splitter, which works a little better than my very naive one here, but I didn't want to install more packages. Or we can split the stride, you can pick whatever works you over here. Um, um, okay. I'm going to use distillbert. Um, I think the sentence bird and sort of the, all the sentence bird variations are, are pretty comparable. Um, the most important thing uh, with any of these encoders or is that they match your domain. Um, if you have a general domain, you're talking about books, reviews, just general language people are, are using day to day, these are going to be fine. If you are doing highly technical legal tax medical documents, you need to find your own encoder. They're not going to be useful. Um, you could all, uh, what I would probably do is just take one of these encoders and then fine tune it, probably with Laura. Um, pretty fast without Laura though, so I'm, I'm not, not certain. Um, that's what I would do. It, it, the most important thing is to make sure that your, your encoder matches your domain space, and at least reasonably. Okay. George. Yeah. Um, can you compare the distilled bird with the, for example, the, uh, the OpenAI text data embedding. So what are the, uh, you know, in terms of performance? Uh, yeah, uh, two things to keep in mind. One, uh, three things. One is the domain, right? You want to make sure that they are mapped to whatever you're actually talking about. Um, second is that output size. This is where you're gonna realistically, depending on how, how liberal your organization is with its compute budget, um, you're gonna run into issues with the <laughs> The, si the actual size yeah. of the embeddings. Yeah. So whether you want to make it, you can make them as small as 384, I believe, and there's a few models that encode to that size. Um, there's some that encode to like 1690, something or other. Um, that's a big consideration. You'll obviously get better results um, with the more context. Um, if there's a trade-off in sort of you know width and, and length that you want to okay. consider. If you have 20 million, if you have, if you have a million, I think you could probably go with a larger context. Um, if you are okay with the latency and compute. Um, if you have like 50 million, 100 million, 200 million, it's not linear scaling in terms of the compute complexity with the phase retrieval, um, but what you're gonna to wanna to do is make sure that you're, you're considering that, and the first thing you wanna do in terms of like making your RAM a little more manageable is lop off that embedding. In a lot of the searches, I, I think people are, those embeddings are, are meant for really long form text. You don't need a huge embedding space to represent most text searches reasonably. Uh, one thing you can do is PCA, and we do actually we do that in a couple of our um, our models, yeah, so that we can have a longer search, but the search is is a lot more narrow. If that makes sense. We match against a lot of things, uh, but we don't see a huge amount of variability, so we can do PCA to, to shrink that down. Yeah. With smaller size text, how important is chunking? Or is that more important when you have longer documents? Um, which it depends on how small. I, I think the big thing is if you want your input text, whatever is coming in from the you know, from the, the chatbot to match what you're matching against or roughly be in the same orders of magnitude. Um, you want you're gonna get better results by chunking and smashing and smaller things in general, especially if you have a strategy for aggregating your results. Um, the smaller matches, assuming you have a small input, is going to work better. Um, sorry, I forgot the exact. That, that yeah, so like if you don't have a long document. You, you don't have a long document. I mean, even if. Embed the whole document versus like. I would always, I'm, I, I'm about to say, I would always chunk at least to the sentence level, um, unless you expect someone to input three or four sentences, or you're going to be trying to, you know, using hide or something to generate three or four sentences. Um, which I think is a terrible idea. Um, I, I would always chunk to probably the sentence level, if not smaller. We found very bad, when we were chunking to the, just like the full descriptions of books and trying to match against that, we, we got things that were in the right neighborhood and you could see they're okay, but you get to, be, you lose a little bit in terms of, well, what, what would you, if, if you're sub-sentence, what would you chunk to, like, just? Uh, I would chunk to like, Five words, no okay. stride over that. Um, yeah. 
the uh, question of embeddings, uh, like just from your experience, open source ones versus open AI. I heard like open AI are kind of better in a sense, or it doesn't, or it doesn't I, really I've never matter. Found, we have not, we, we paid uh, a couple hundred dollars to do some encoding with, with open AI and found no appreciable difference. You, you want it to match your use case. They might have more general ones. But we found a lot of success with the sentence encoder part of Hugging Face. So if you go in there, there's a couple um, What's your that we use pretty extensively. The still bird is is good. It's probably one I would fine tune for a specific you know, uh, domain rather than trying to use that with bird. Um, but I think you're in a good spot. Yeah, just a quick follow up. So, what's your favorite embedding models? Sorry. What's your favorite or most recommend embedding models? Uh, I I would recommend in general uh, the still bird as a starting place. I like and all sometimes encoders. I like this one a lot. We've had a lot of success with um, all MPNet based V2 in longer form. Um, when we're dealing with things that we know are going to be proper sentences. Uh, if we're dealing with things that we know are going to be relatively short chunks, like you're matching against tags, authors, whatever, um, still bird is has done just fine. There's not a big difference. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. So we've got a question from the YouTube chat, and this is from Alan who actually gave a RAG talk at the Bethesda Data Science Meetup recently. And his question is, in your sub-sentence chunking, are you using overlaps? Um, we, have, we have been in some contexts and not in others, <laughs> which isn't a really helpful <laughs> answer. Um, when we're looking for specific, um, when we're looking for like things like specific locations or really specific, like when we've routed to modules that are much more dependent on having an exact match on uh, a concept, that's where we've done overlap and had a lot more success. Um, so if you're looking for, again, in, in our search, which we're probably not getting into, um, sorry, I'll just hit this and we'll talk about it later. If you're running something like looking for Brad Pitt, it's nice to get Brad Pitt a couple times. It's also prevents you from, if you have a multi-word phrase that you're looking for specifically, if the chunking routine you're doing is not sentence, uh, is not sentence smart, and it can chunk in the middle of a sentence or you know, something like that, you're gonna wind up in situations where you have Brad and you have Pitt that are separated out. And then you can, it's, you're gonna get an okay match on some of it, and if you do some smoothing and aggregation, you might be okay. Um, but I would use an overlap. I would generally have a stride that is lower than your window. Yes? Um, to follow up on that question, if I understood correctly, I think earlier you were mentioning something about getting your initial retrieved information and then using your structured data to augment that. Would you ever take like rows, like adjacent splits and like glue them together after? 100%, but that aggregation is one of the most, to get the actual context you want, is you want to retrieve on something and know the things that are around it to give, if, you, if you're <coughs> chunk on anything more than the sentence level, I think at a sentence level you're probably, you could probably get away with it, but if you're doing chunking like this where you have a window, um, that is, Token chunking. yeah exactly, and then you, you want to make sure that you provide the full context, so you can give it uh, a couple sentences ahead and a couple sentences below um, to your LLM for you know whether you're stuffing or whatever, however you want to do that generation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What vector database are you using? <coughs> use phase. Uh, and we use phase CPU. It's a lot better. The, uh, the performance of phase CPU versus GPU, the time to move the vectors to GPU space is not worth it at our smaller vector size. I think as you expand out horizontally, it might become more important, but we are, it is, even at like 50 million, it's a lot faster for us and some of ours to just use the, the CPU. Do you hear that one? Yes. the base keys maybe? Oh, the base. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How would I troubleshoot to figure out what happens? Yeah, I mean, so the first thing, uh, what, what, what I would do here, right, is I would, it gave you hopefully this, right, Home for the Holidays, boring yeah, yeah. movie, yeah. Um, I would be looking at that embedding. Uh, I mean, one, I would take this as a, this, when you find these individual things that fail, what you want to do is you want to iterate on this and say, okay, what happens if I chunk on, uh, if I chunk in a different way, what happens if I use a different embedding scheme, what happens if I'm, 
if I try a different, I guess, aggregation scheme for my encoder, right? Those are things you want to experiment with here. This is, let's see, yeah, th th and this becomes then part of your test case that you're moving forward. The next time you see a failure, you're going back and you're checking that you haven't just corrected the, the old ones that these, I don't want to call them test cases because you're never going to get exact matches. Uh, you need uh, your Ushan to go and just make sure that everything lines up still roughly for all of them that you haven't overcorrected there. So do you have something that looks sort of like unit tests? Sorry? So do you have something that looks sort of like unit tests? Like are, do, you, do you have test cases? Like we have uh, sets of test cases that we're, we're doing, yeah. I wouldn't call, I, I don't like calling them test cases because they still have a human in the loop. Um, we don't have an automatic. I guess good use case for something you've been talking about is you compare our expected versus you know what we get and seeing is that similar. That might be a really good actually application for an LLM to yeah, I should like that a lot. Uh, you, you mentioned at the start that you recommend using guardrails for end user interaction. Yes. Um, what sort of guardrails do you have in place? So we have ones that are looking for if someone's trying to be like toxic and hostile to our, our chatbot, if someone is trying to get something that is like grossly sexually explicit, um, those are things that we have in place. We have that both at the initial query stage, um, and then when we found that things do get through, um, because we have some some prompt engineering in the um, in the actual queries that are, are created and sent out to the Llama 7 billion, we don't get bad results back generally. We have a default that we originally had, um, or we had like ready to go, um, in terms of, hey, we couldn't help you with this, blah, 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 blah. Um, but those are the kind of things we're, we're looking for, as well as like SQL. <coughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. So this is size was super important. Um, do you have to only pick one chunk size when you have multiple chunk sizes? I you know multiple chunk sizes. I, we, I don't think we, we have not done multiple chunk sizes for the same vector database, but I don't think there's any reason you couldn't. There's not any reason you couldn't, um, other than RAM constraints. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's your take on uh, how to choose a vector database? Uh, you said you use phase. We use phase. Um, I think phase is more RAM intensive uh, and faster compute than scan. Uh, oh. That's the, the trade-off there. Um, it's we didn't find huge performance gaps in either. They were matching to slightly different things, um, but it wasn't any different than we were just trying to like tune the, the hyperparameters on phase. I I don't think it's a good use of time to. I would pick one and stick with it um, and tune everything around it. I don't think right now and, and make that decision based on the size of your data and the size of your computer environment. Um, I don't think that there's huge value in changing your semantic search. Um, so what what do you think about like those page services like Pinecone or like Elasticsearch? Yeah, so I mean, Pinecone is, is a wrapper for a lot of the things we've talked about, um, uh -huh. uh, and then Elasticsearch is its own algorithm that that is on more on an exact ter uh, text basis. Mm -hmm. That you would do in a kind of a hybrid environment. So can we do use that in <coughs> specific cases um, as part of like. Yeah, do a financial retrieval for the semantic search and afterwards. There's value for, for some of those things. Well, there's not, I hope no one here works with Pinecone or sort of other Pinecone. I'm not sure there's a huge amount of value if you understand the principal components. Yes? Uh, a question on the embeddings. So I researched a bit some time ago, <laughs> like different kinds of uh, embeddings, and I found that in most of them, like a sign similarity between sentences, like I like apples uh, and I don't like apples, it's like actually really like, not just, I mean, it's high. Yeah. And yeah. in a sense, like those sentences are <coughs> like the different. Yeah. So uh, maybe like you have some dates on that. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's why it's important to get multiple. You don't want to take your top response, right? You want to get that smooth. You want to either smooth out and get a, a lot of responses and use that to you know stuff and have like you know five or six pieces of context you're providing to the language model, and then it's able to sort of make a recommendation based on that. Um, or you want to, you know, I guess do it some other kind of aggregation where you're saying, you know, we're looking for this term to be appear in, in like associated with this book ID lots of times in our top thousand results or something like that. So you want to smooth over it and then hope that your LLM is going to do a good job. Um, it is the negative case is really hard and and not anything that there's probably a way to. Uh, some of it gets handled by good prompt engineering 
and saying, hey, here are some reviews for this. Tell me why you like this, or this person will like this because they like these kind of books. Um, and some of that gets smoothed over by an LLM. It's really hard to diagnose. We have seen cases, and there's times where you just like, we'll give a little more context to the chatbot, and that'll be fine. Um, I do think, and again, I've looked at it, the, the MapReduce strategy of create for, um, for different uh, responses and then uh, consolidating those. I think that would be very effective in dealing with a false positive in terms of from your retrieval, um, but I haven't tested that. Oh, when you're saying content generic, are you talking about what case shot, what few shot examples um, embedded in the prompt? Or wait, could you expand on what yeah. sort of prompt engineering you're doing? So I mean, part of that is, you know, first off sandwiching that you only want to Here's like here's the context. Here's the here's the exact. Only use the in ragging. The most important thing is saying here's the context. You only ground your result in the context which we are providing here. Use only the context. Putting that in the system prompt at the start of your prompt and at the end of the prompt. It, that's the only way we have gotten consistent. Good, uh, Do you use uppercase at all? Do you like shout anything? Yeah, we, yeah. we use any exclamation points. We um, yeah. we bold it, um, <laughs> which is important. Again, bolding works. Um, they understand Markdown, or Obama understands Markdown. Yeah. It's, it's really important. Um, and so yeah, at that point, then I'm talking about we're we're trusting that if we give it six examples, six reviews, and we say this is a positive. We think this person will like this book. Here's six reviews. Um, that it's going to do a good job of aggregating that information and ignoring the negative review. We have another question from Alan in the chat. Is the main problem with cosine similarity that it is too slow? And that's why you're using the fast um, index flat uh, L2. Yeah, it's, it's a speed thing. Um, you don't want to do one, I guess, yeah. The, the compute on that is um, in the neighborhood of a couple seconds. Um, and that's just really slow. There's no reason you need to be taking that much time approximate nearest neighbors is going to save you a lot. Your user experience is going to be terrible if they have to wait three seconds, two, two seconds for your your LLM call and another two to three seconds for the retrieval plus whatever you put in the middle. Um, and cosine similarity, which I have a lot of love for. Um, and use in other places um, because it, it's, it's totally fine you know, if it's you know a case of 20 versus 100. Um, but approximate nearest neighbors is it's speed. It's just speed. In the beginning of the talk, you mentioned the class token versus the main embedding, but I forgot the context surrounding that. Can you just expand on what you meant by that? Yes, um, I can pull the code here. We have two. Um, all right, so we have the class embedding. So the class embedding, you are just taking, it, you, the way LLMs work, right, is that they're basically pulling all the embeddings closer and closer to one another based on the context of that one, right? So, the idea with a mean embedding is that originally in BERT that was used for the classification of are these two sentences adjacent to one another? Um, that was, so they had a class token there that was trying to identify that. Um, what we're, and then people use that, and that's pretty reasonable as an approximation that people then sort of classify from. Because obviously at the end you have, um, if you have 20 input tokens, right, you have a 20 by 768 matrix that you're using. You want that to be flat and you want that to be one dimensional so it's easier to use in classification purposes or in vector database similarity. Um, and, and so the ways to do that is one is just to take that class token, which is a, a good and reasonable representation, um, or you can just take the, the average across the vector. Uh, and so in terms of here for, for mean pooling, <coughs> right, all you're going to do is basically take you know, for the first element of all the 20, you're going to take the average, and the second element for all the 20, you're going to take the average, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down the line. Um, this works a lot. This is, we have found to be much more performant. So the way, yeah, the way you reduce that, your encoded value down to a single vector. Um, those are the two strategies I am familiar with. There, there may be others. Um, there may be, you know, what I, I think would actually be interesting here is in this tokenized inputs is figuring out a way to weight in frequent terms, um, in frequent tokens. I would be curious if that, uh, the performance of that from an academic standpoint, I wouldn't spend my free time doing it. Yes. Is, uh, is you guys, you said you guys use space, right? Yes. Is, is that in memory? Is that in memory? Yeah, memory. Yeah, we have a, uh, a 384 gigabyte server that is in charge of all of our vector databases. That's yeah, that was going to be my, my <laughs> next, uh, if you guys run into cost uh, 
No, I mean, those servers, if you pick a high memory server, you're, you're looking at like $1,500 a month, um, which is not too bad. Um, we're comfortable with that. For our, it's definitely not cheap, um, but we found, we have looked at the speed performances, the, the improvements of uh, moving into a GPU, and the, GP, the cost of a GPU server is much higher, um, even like a single T4, which wouldn't hold some of our databases. The speed is um, slightly better in certain circumstances, depending on the width of the, the embedding, um, the size of the embedding, and the number of embeddings you have, but the cost is better. Gotcha. Other people might find that, I'm not sure. But I, I, I'm wondering if you have like a lot of really small or a couple of really large embeddings. You could probably tune your uh, HMSW around that, which is like the algorithm that we use by default. That's just highly navigable, small worlds. I think that's true. If that's not true, don't correct me. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, so there's a lot of fun examples in here. Um, play around with it. I apologize we didn't actually get to talk about it too much of it. At the end, um, I guess there's two things here that are interesting. The first is like a route and rag. This function is really at a high level what I'm talking about what you should do. Um, you should classify what they're trying to do and then change the behavior based on that. Um, in our case, we only have two behaviors that so we can't do it and then to send it off, but this prevents someone who's asking billing questions from getting our, uh, a recommendation for uh, a movie about billing. Um, and then at the end here, I wish I knew where I stole this from like many months ago so I could show you the whole thing. Uh, I guess that's what everyone does with all their code. Um, this is just how you can train a classifier, um, silver in this case, but it should work for any sequence classification model um, with LoRa. Uh, here's the parameters you can tune. You have your rank, you have uh, this LoRa alpha, which is roughly analogous to a learning rate. Um, you have dropout, which you should know. And here's the target modules, and this is kind of the important part. This is telling Laura which things you want to do approximations for, uh, and which, you know, when on the forward pass and backward pass and everything, what you're actually going to be training as of that. Um, and then, yeah, you, you plug it in. This is the wrapper, right? You give it the config. You say the F model for this model, which again is just a standard torch model, something you've been working with. You give it some basic training arguments for the trainer object. Um, and again, these are really bad because I don't have an evaluation set, so don't use this for real, please. Um, but in terms of just functionally getting something here, this, this works. Uh, and yeah, you get that, it trains you get a nice little LoRa model. Um, if you want to expand it in, then you have a quick little method for that. And yeah, that, that's, so I know we ran over. Thank you guys for staying a little late, I appreciate it. If you have other questions, oh, sorry, one more. Last one. Last one. Uh, last one. <laughs> Do you use things like SageMaker or like it's, it's mostly you know Python application on a like hardware? You know? um, yeah, at th this point I I stand up a, a server. My my current workflow is I stand up a server that looks approximately like what I'm gonna have when I create a Docker environment, and I, I basically deploy a Jupyter notebook from there. Mm -hmm. I do my testing, my unit tests, and I make sure everything works. I make sure, and this is the frustrating thing I learned later, it's just that I'm using the right, I'm using consistent credentials that those are embedded into my, um, <laughs> those are embedded into my project in some way, whether that's a retrieval from a, a GCS server or the actual JSON file. Uh, I'm doing my deployment there, I'm unit, doing basic tests out, and then I'm just deploying things in Docker and spamming it and doing deploys there until something breaks or doesn't break and it works. Um, and then, yeah, once I have a server that's stood up in a Docker environment that roughly works, then you know you can just SSH in there uh, and either deploy your Jupyter notebook from that, or you know I still find that I do I have eighty percent of my work from that um, in terms of like initial small stuff and trying to get individual functions to work, um, and then ten percent is probably from just getting IPython uh, in that same instance and not bothering to spin up a notebook just to get something tested really quick. Uh, and then I guess the other 10% is um, hoping it works when I do a live. <laughs> what about inference? Are you doing inference on that same? Like we have, um, so the, I guess our current structure is we have one um, server that, we have one server that does, handles the, the routing that does that initial classification, things are coming, that's a pretty small lightweight server. Um, that sends things back to the correct, uh, we have a couple different uh, servers we have stood up for phase, we have two stood up for phase. 
Um, and then those results come back to that middle server, that sort of intermediate server that then sends it to a chatbot, and then once it comes back from the chatbot, that gets sent back to the user. So three servers that are really involved there. Yes? How often are we, is the vector database being updated? Um, the vector database is being updated when, uh, now it's not too often. Mm -hmm. uh, originally, we, what we did was we spun up like basically 20, 30 different variations for the main thing. The main thing we want to do is search and have an effective search for, um, like you asking about genres or, or tropes or things like that. We spun up 20 or 30 different permutations to try out. Um, and then we just, in our UI for testing, we had a little drop down that changed what was being requested. Um, so again, we worked with a slightly smaller data set to start, and that way the phase server could hold all 20 permutations at once. And that just became an argument that was passed back um, when you made the request, so we could try out things pretty quickly. Once we had a general idea, we started narrowing it down, expanding the data set out, um, but it was a lot of trial and error. Since you mentioned the uh, hallucination, uh, can you share your experience on that? How do you detect and prevent any such thing? I mean, RAG is the best way to prevent hallucination. Um, RAG, where you give it really explicit instructions um, at the, the beginning and the end of the prompt. Um, hallucinations are, yeah, are, are, are a problem, especially if you're asking it to do something that the chatbot is not good at. Like, yeah. Last one, really, really <laughs> last one. <laughs> I want to be respectful of everyone else. Yeah, maybe I missed, but uh, did you guys come up with a systematic evaluation uh, to? Not, no, we have a 22 year old. <laughs> so, I love Abigail's idea on our, our test cases that we found. We currently don't have a systematic evaluation. Um, I do like the idea. I'm a little nervous about outsourcing too much. Maybe it was like the situation where you outsource part of it to the other LLM. So we have Llama, and then we pay for ChatGPT to test our <coughs> and compare them a little bit against each other. That's probably what I'll wind up doing. But yeah, don't have okay. You can check out a package called Rags. That's a kind of oh. What's the name of them? And there's those, uh, I think there's those, I think. <laughs> uh, they, they also build some systems to evaluate that kind of system. There's one called Autobox. I think, Abigail, can you tell me if this is a good idea? This sounds like a really good courthouse conversation. Yes! <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah.